on to the second section of the evening. Um, I'm going to be joined by my co-host, Dr. Brendan Dumfrit of the Burn Programme. Um, we are delighted to welcome two of our Farming for Nature ambassadors, uh, farmers Tommy Early from County uh, Roscommon and Kim McCall from County Kildare. Both uh, farmers have totally different land types, um, but both are doing extraordinary measures to farm alongside nature and working hard to encourage more nature on their farms. So tonight, hopefully, we'll learn more about their farming practices and their methods for enhancing nature on their farms. Thanks, um, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, I just want to start with a question. Um, Tommy, what do you feel is your biggest success story to date in terms of nature on your farm? Um, biggest success story, I suppose there's a, a number of habitats on the farm, but I suppose the biggest one that we've had, um, I, I would say, is the, the area bog that we have. I suppose it's one area that there has been a lot of work done. There's a, there's a lot of bog, yeah. So you've, have you been doing a lot of research on that bog area, is it? There's a good bit of research on it, and uh, the species that are on it are doing okay. So that's, that's a big thing for us. Because um, just today, now we were down, um, we're doing, with the COVID thing this year, there isn't going to be any walks during Heritage Week. You probably know. So what the Heritage Officer, um, what they're doing is they're making a couple of little short films on the different day uh, where, where the walks might have been. And uh, today we were lucky enough that we were uh, down on that walk and we were actually able to uh, film the marsh for dinner. Mm -hmm. So that's still a bit of a right now. You might just very quickly, Tommy, explain to me and maybe to the audience um, what is it you did on the bog in order to um, you know, create a, a, a thriving bog ecosystem? What, what have you deliberately done with it? Well, what we've done so far is we've blocked uh, some of the perimeter drains that are on it. That are eaten up the bog. We've done that about uh, 15 years ago. But there, more recently, we uh, got involved with Queen's University in Belfast. And we're doing a research project at the moment with them to uh, see how best we could restore greater areas of the bog. So that rather than, um, you say, if, if you just re-wet a bog, that means that, that you'll just about hold on to the carbon that's in it. But if you can return the bog to its natural conditions, you start to sequester the carbon, start to take it back in again. And that's, that's where you want to be. Thank you. Uh, Brendan, do you have any questions there for Tommy? Yes, uh, Tommy. Um, I just looked at the video there again, and it's, it reminds me of the amazing work that you do. I, I hope everybody could hear and see the video clearly. Maybe some people didn't, but if they didn't, maybe have a look afterwards because it's really um, amazing. I think what what's been done. The sort of I had a couple of questions, Tommy. The first one was why? Like, why are you planting oak trees? Why are you um, building palms? Why are you uh, restoring bogs? What is it about yourself that motivates you to do all these amazing things for for nature and for climate? Well, I suppose I've been um, I've been very lucky in that a, a lot of people have come to visit the place, and uh, different people that were into different things. You know, some into bats, some into birds, some into clouds. And when you see, we'd say the habitat through their eyes and see the appreciation they have, you see then how lucky you are to, you know, to be able to be part of managing it or keeping it as it is. So that gives me uh, great satisfaction, I suppose, and to hope then that we'll be able to pass it on in as good a condition that, as we got it. So that we'd say future generations will be able to enjoy what we have at the moment. And Tommy, following on from that, I mean, the generation that you got the land from, you know, when you were growing up, did your did your parents pass on much of knowledge about or love of nature on the farm? Or when you were a young garsoon around the fields, how did you see the land and nature? Or what got you interested in the first place? Well, I suppose when, when I was in the National School, we had, um, we had a boat down on the lake. And... Uh, to be honest, there's more days spent on the lake than the water in school. So that, that was the thing. And uh, yeah, so, and I suppose you, you were always out to be, you knew what was happening in different, in different places, but you wouldn't have had the, um, you wouldn't have maybe had the names of the flowers, or you wouldn't certainly have had any names of the butterflies, or any of the names of the moths, you know. So I've been lucky to, to gather that information in the last while. So it, um, 
as I say, I've been lucky with the people that I've met, and they've inspired me greatly for to, to continue to do what I'm doing. And what do your neighbours, Tommy, how do they view uh, the kind of how you manage your farm? Is there sort of a thinking, um, my God, what's that fellow at at all? Or are they looking on with, um, with a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, interest at this point after all these years of, of, of work that you've done? Oh, no, no, they're, 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 um, well, in fairness, my farm wouldn't be as good only that their farms are a neighbourhood in a lot of cases. Because we'd say, you can't have, we'd say, one habitat, habitat living as a, a, an island on its own. So there, there wouldn't be any intense farming, put it that way, around. And uh, the neighbourhood would be all supportive. Mm. They're still, uh, still all on talking terms anyway, so it's not so bad. So <laughs> they, um, they would be supportive of, of the, he said the different ventures that are going on. And uh, there'd be regular visitors to the farm. Like we'd be working through each other, you know, helping each other with machinery and different bits and pieces. Yeah, and, and just kind of connecting um, the first talk by Jane uh, with, with, with your little video there, Tommy, and your case study. I mean, Jane highlighted like the challenges we face in Ireland uh, with biodiversity loss and, you know, the, 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 uh, the relationship with farming. Farming isn't the only cause behind it, but it's one of the major drivers of, of, of biodiversity change. So if you were to think about your, your fellow farmers across Ireland, I mean, how do you kind of um, influence, I suppose, or persuade those farmers to, you know, to follow your example to some degree, or maybe to make even smaller changes uh, to their farm in support of nature? What kind of, how would you go about changing those, um, uh, persuading people to, to make the change, even at a local level? Well, I, I have a number where we said before this COVID thing kicked up. I, um, I would have walked on a regular basis and most, most of the locals would have been here at some stage and some of them will come for walks, we'll say maybe not under an official one, but they'll come up just to see what are you, what are you planting at the moment or if there's a bit of hedge game going on, they'll cry just to see what's, what's happening with it, you know. So I suppose uh, and I've been looking that I've got onto other farms away from me or another farm walks. So, I think farmers like, like to, to get their feet on the ground and have a look themselves to see what's going on rather than anything else. And I think that more than anything will convince them to either do it or not to do it. You know, they like to come along and you know, maybe ask the questions and there's nobody looking, you know, but they're, uh, they're definitely very curious. So you think that uh, peer learning from farmer to farmer is, 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 is very important? I think so, yeah. 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 Um, and another question, and I might pass on to Bridget then, because there's some technical questions about ponds um, in, in a moment. But um, economics, Tommy, people always ask about money. Um, like farming the way you are, um, do you feel you're supported by the market uh, in terms of the, the value you get for your food? Do you feel that you're supported sufficiently by policy uh, and by advice? Um, do you feel that you and other farmers um, uh, are acknowledged in terms of the work that you do and, and the support that you need? Is, 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 what would you like to see change in that regard? Well, of course, no, no farm will run without money coming in. And uh, you will make a certain, money among, a certain amount of money from selling cattle. But uh, I also do a few other things on the farm. So the farm tours and farm walks, that's, a, that's another income stream. I also do a thing uh, called social farming. That's where people from the healthcare services who come onto the farm one day a week or a period of time. So that's another income stream as well. So I, I think to survive, we'd say, in farming, you have to have a, you'd have to be trying a few different things. You know, you can, you, you, you wouldn't survive just with an, an income from cash. And I'm hopeful that in the future, we'd say the area of that we have, you know, I've seen in the video, that there will be payments for, we'd say, storing the carbon, that you will have carbon rights in it, and that uh, you'll be able to sell those rights, maybe to some local company or something like that. I don't know how that might work out financially, but hopefully going forward, that um, that, that would be another stream as well. So, as as you described farming, Tommy, is you're not just a food producer; you're kind of a a service provider in terms of education, healthcare, um, ecosystem services, food production. So you've you've got many hats in your boat. Do you think do you think that that's possible for other farmers or do you think that it's just something you know that, that, that 
your interest and your ability drives. Is, 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 is there a future like that for other farmers in Ireland, you think, just not just as food producers, but as, as, as more than that? Well, every farm and every farmer has a story to tell. You know? And I think that uh, in terms of the, what, what can be done with farms is, I've had a couple of people here and uh, toying with the notion that it would be lovely to, to link up all the farms around that area. You could walk from one farm onto another farm onto the next farm, and that you wouldn't have to use the main road at all. Like that would take a, a lot of work to get that organised. But it, it's a doable thing if you have the numbers coming through, and then you could work something similar. We have a, a walkway system here for the miners' way, and a farmer is paid by the linear meter of that one through your farm. So, um, and that's that's a, that's another income onto the farm as well. So if you had something like that for the other walkway, where you know people could say come into the area, maybe on some farms they might camp, on some farms they might um, have food, and other farms they might just walk through, and the farmer could be acting as a tour guide. So the farmer might want to do that or not himself, but it was an accommodation that took farms up by the road and some gateways into one farm to the other. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of possibilities there, especially with the tools on that. And I just one more thing I wanted to ask. I meant to ask it earlier before I hand across to Bridget. I've 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 had the privilege, Tommy, of hearing you speak before um, on, on a few occasions, and it's very inspiring. So, would you mind just sharing um, what your farm is like at the moment? So, if you were to take a walk across your farm now, what kind of uh, biodiversity? What kind of wildlife would you see from the flowers to the insects to the to the bird life? What's what's out there to minute in in Leitrim, lovely Leitrim? Ross Common. Ross Common, sorry. Well, we'll Lovely Ross Common. <laughs> we're, we're right on the border here. We're just four minutes from them chambers away. <laughs> um, but so, what we're looking at at the moment is, um, in terms of rare species, you know, to, to, to uh, look at that, is that we were filming Marsh Artillery this morning uh, for a Heritage Week. You know, we're going to be doing videos on that. But we're also I'm working with another group, and they're filming a curlew. That's uh, the curlew. Uh, has nested about a mile and a half away from us, and uh, she uh, they found uh, they found the nest there last last week. So they have um, a net up around the nest for nest protection. So there's four eggs in it. So uh, that curlew is coming over, uh, the male and female. They, they alternate on the nest, and they're coming over and they're actually feeding on the lake shore here on, on my property here. So that's nice. So we're trying to get some footage of the curlew feeding on the nature. Sure. Fantastic. That's really, uh, wonderful to see, I'm sure. Bridget, do you want to ask um, uh, those couple of questions? Yeah, like I'm, I'm aware that actually a few people might not have been able to see the video just there. And as you, you were just asking, Tommy, there about um, about some of the biodiversity. Tommy, you might just um, reiterate for people if they can, in case they didn't see it. So you have peatland, you have woodland. What's what biodiversity has changed in the time that you have been farming the land? As in, what have you seen increase? What have you seen come back? What other kind of spe what's I mentioned at the beginning your kind of success stories, but what a kind of biodiversity increases have you seen from the work that you have been doing on your farm? Well, um, we put in a number of ponds on the farm, and I think what, uh, to put in a pond is. A very good thing in terms of wildlife. Um, it will attract in a lot of different species in its own right. Um, we've had some ducks breeding on that. There was a, a little island on one of the ponds. Um, you'll have frogs coming in, newts, the dragonflies. Um, yeah, it, it, a pond would be, I'd say, if you want to bring one feature, I definitely go with a, a pond. And different size ponds, you know, wildlife will use any size of a pond. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely, so ponds would be one thing that will definitely increase the range of, of species on your farm. Also, hedgerows are very important too. And uh, how you manage the hedgerow as well is very important. We um, lay a couple of the hedges here, we try and lay a little bit every year, um, and we leave some of the hedges to grow uh, up high. Because different species will use different heights in the hedgerow for nesting and different things. Perfect. And tell me, tell me, what do you feel is maybe the biggest threat to your farm or your neighbours' farms in your area of, of Roscommon's Road Leitrim? The, the biggest 
threat, I suppose, it would be concern, and it's been happening over the last number of decades, would be the land use change. Um, we've seen a, a lot of uh, plantations being done in this part of the thing. I think in Leeds, from about 20, roughly around 20% of the land has been planted in the last, over the last few decades. So that, that's an, an enormous loss of biodiversity. And uh, we, need, we need open landscape, especially we said, we mentioned the corridor there, and I was saying there, it has, where it's moving from, moving from its nesting area to its feeding area. It actually has to fly over a forestry. But in the past, that would have been an open, open landscape. And it's those open lowland landscapes is where the greatest uh, diversity of species there. And we're losing those, we're losing, um, that's, that's the biggest loss. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. I'll just uh, finish up on my side with just a question, um, and then I'll swap across to Brendan again, and we can. Um, there's a few questions coming up here. This is from a John Cross. I assume Tommy raises cattle. Um, how does he manage his grassland and what species are there, Tommy, if you can help answer that? Did you hear me? Sorry. Tommy? I didn't get the last bit of the question there, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. I, I assume Tommy raises cattle. How does he manage his grassland and what species are there? Okay. The, the, um, what's, what the type of cattle we have is Aberdeen Angus. Uh, we have suckler cows on the farm and uh, in terms of managing them, the cows and calves are out for the summer months and they're housed in um, loose bedded cows for the winter months and we save our own hay or silage depending on the year. Mm -hmm. Okay and uh, you have a rich uh, diversity of species on the grass do you um, Tommy? There's a good, there's a, yeah, there would be a, a good range of grasses in it. Um, it goes to, uh, yeah, there would be a, a quite, a, quite a range of flowers in them and quite a range of grasses in them. Yeah, fair enough. None of the fields would have been never reseeded or anything like that. So. Okay, yeah, perfect. Uh, I'll take another question up here. So, um, Tommy, do you um, do you know of anyone else? This is from a Michael Devery. Do you know of anyone else rewetting the bogs or doing research into the process of rewetting bogs? Um, is this here in Ireland or in? Uh, I'd, I'd say we'll stick with Ireland. Yeah, if you know. Of yeah, you. yeah. Um, well, as I say, we're working with a guy from uh, Queen's, Dr. Evelyn from Queen's University in Belfast, and uh, he's working on a number of projects with a number of different people that are. Doing something similar. I know Welch have rewet some areas, but yeah. So okay. there, there is such work being done in other places as well. Okay. So it's probably available up on his website, is it? Yeah. yeah. Probably. Yeah. Contact him, maybe up to let you know. Yeah. yeah, of course, yeah. Um, right, I'll go for another one. Uh, Sean O'Farrell has asked Hi, Tommy, what is the minimum debt you would recommend for the pond? Um, I suppose depending on the size of the pond, but ideally you don't want the pond to dry up and uh, you need to have a little bit of cover, we'd say for some of the deep, we'd say for frogs or that, that if there's something coming in from us that, that they can get down to the bottom. So I'd say maybe a metre, metre and a half, if you can go that, you know, you go a little bit more. But uh, the important thing with the ponds is to keep the slope about 15 degrees going into them. So that what it, so that wildlife can be in easy enough and come back out, and also to keep them say as the pond develops in, to keep the south side of the pond open to for sunlight to get into it. Mm -hmm. you get a, it's okay to have shelter on the north side, but uh, you you want that shallow water around the edge of the pond for the to warm up quickly, and that will get the insects going. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Um. I'll take one more question here and then I'll pass back over to Brendan. There's an Una Sugri. Um, what inputs do you put into your grassland to create biodiversity? Do you put any lime in, um, Tommy? Or you, you leave it as is, do you? We know those, those lines up when we went into reps, but it was only put in at about 20 a day. That's about 20 something years ago. No, we haven't put in any lime since then. Mm -hmm. So the, all, all the fertilizer it gets is the primary manure. Perfect, yeah, thank you. 
Brendan? Okay, Bridget, um, I think we're, we're um, running out of time for questions. So a couple of quick ones that just came in um, uh, from Michael Hegarty. Um, Tommy, what tree species or mixture do you find suitable on your type of land if planting on the margins or corners of fields? Um, we have, well, it, it, it uh, we said on, we have a block of oak in some ash, a block of ash in, and there's a block of alder. So that they're the three main blocks we plant up in the woodlands. Um, but already existing there that there's some there's still for birch that that's a holly and you know some old stands in woodland as well, and that's what predominates it. It's, uh, it's pretty much still for birch with an understory of holly in it. Okay, very good. And on the hedgerows in there. Yeah. And on the hedgerows in there's quite a lot of uh, white thorn as well and some willow as well. Brilliant. Okay, maybe a last question then. I'm Bridget's going to post another video, um, a fantastic video. One question we get a lot at Farming for Nature um, is for people who have a small piece of land, maybe a field or so, and they want to do something for nature on that field. It might be a species of grassland or something like that. Is there any advice you might give to them? Uh, for instance, here is uh, uh, from Mary Reese. My family only has about 10 acres of farmland. Do you have any suggestions how we focus our efforts in habitat conservation? We have a small pond already. You have a pond already, well, that, that, that's good. Um, what, what I will do is to, if you could find out all the all the history you can of the farm, you know, and see see what we would say with the people before, were they producing crops and any fees, what range did they do, you know, and see what, what our neighbouring farmers do. Because um, or what, what are their plans with their farms? You know, is something we're planting up some woodland beside you? So, if you can do both, that can complement each other rather than, uh, well, you know, that, that it won't be contrast to what's going on at the same time. Um, so, I'd find out as much information as you can and find out as much about the species you have there already. Because there is lots of people that will help you with surveys and different things. And, uh, you can see what species are there and you can maybe target it towards from whatever. Because we'd say, sometimes we'd say, if you're doing a, a conservation and you might want rare species or something, it's quite hard to have to kind of work on things for that one species. And uh, you have to kind of maybe be at the loss of some other nice species that you might like to have as well. But if one species is in, is in particular need, but it might be best to concentrate on helping that one. Okay, Tommy, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Uh, loads of great questions and really practical answers, Tommy. So much appreciated. Uh, we've got another amazing farmer. Um, Tommy is an amazing guy, and we've got another amazing man as well coming up um, now, Kim. So I'm going to hand you over to Bridget. Uh, this video is really worth watching. So hopefully you can stay tuned because uh, this is a kind of unique opportunity to. I guess meet the farmers on the ground who are doing great work for nature and we'll tell you a little bit. Uh, Kim, you might be just able to describe for me your farm a bit, the different habitats you have and perhaps what you've deliberately done or continue to do for biodiversity on your land. Well, firstly, the farm is a reasonably big farm, it's about 200 and 214 acres comprising of pretty well all grassland, but we have about 30 acres of woodland of various ages, some some old trees and some new ones and some replants. Um, we have a lot of ponds uh, and in the grassland we have a, a quite a lot of wet grassland and then we have dry grassland and probably everything in between and we've got a good diversity of insects, birds, animals um, and we run a suckler herd and a flock of sheep. Great. And tell me, um, what you know? What has what do you feel is your biggest success story for biodiversity, Kim, in in the time that you've been farming the land? It's probably a a number of different things. I mean, when we now have jays all the time, which if you have jays, you have acorns, you have oaks. Um, what else? So we've got various different butterflies that come back. I mean, I saw my first uh, small heath there yesterday, and a, a common blue. Uh, we've got a, up to 10 or 11 different species of bumblebee, um, countless spiders, I haven't a clue what they are, but I'm just pleased to see them, um, solitary bees. So it's really 
opened a panacea of nature. I mean, to farm this way is expansive, whereas I think so much modern farming is, is they home in on more and more about less and less. And this type of farming is, you, you never get to the bottom of it. You're always learning. Do you feel kind of the opinion amongst, you know, in your like neighbor, in the farming community is changing towards farming for nature? Or what do you feel, um, has that changed much, sorry, in, in the much, in the, the few decades that you've been farming? Well, I started my own right farming in 1986 and uh, it was thought of as, you know, a completely off the wall, but more and more people are coming back now and thinking, you know, it's not such a bad, bad idea and it's, it's interesting and how can we do it? And I think that's the biggest problem for farmers nowadays is the information is, as you say, through the various websites, but they like to see it in reality. They like to come and see a stone wall with a stoat running in it and or a, 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 where a blue tit would nest where a robin might nest they actually like to see it hear it feel it touch it smell it um, mm -hmm. websites are great but they do like the hands-on approach so i think we need to have more hands-on farm visits not necessarily to my farm or to tommy's but to a myriad of farms across the, across the country to actually educate farmers it should be part of chagas uh, remit to actually educate farmers on what their natural um, diversity is on their farms. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have it, try and produce it. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting point. Um, I, I just have one more question for you and then I'll, I'll pass over to Brendan. Um, if you were to you know, give a piece of advice to farmers that are watching this evening, like what is, you know, what quick fixes could they do on their farm? What kind of piece of advice would spring to mind for you? Uh, it, without being a facetious common, I think probably sit on the hands and look. Um, I heard a comment I know I've used in the past that observation is the basis of intelligence. And I think that's it to actually look, see what your farm has. Um, it probably has an awful lot more than you think it has. So if you just do nothing and walk around the farm at various times of the day or night, winter and summer and see what it does have. And if it has things that interest you, then look them up and see what they're, why they're there and how you can actually encourage them. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thanks. A nature audit, I like it. Yeah, over to you, Brendan. Yeah, thanks, Kim. I just tuned into the video again and it's, it's amazing. It's so informative and entertaining at the same time. And you've got a, a few great lines in it. Um, a couple of things struck me. Um, uh, came both from what you said in the video and, and from my own experience, tidiness, this notion of tidiness on the farm. Um, well, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Because yeah, you said in the video that there seems to be a, like a, this, this determination to keep the farm nice and neat and tidy. Um, could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I think there's certain parts of the farm you should keep tidy. For one, your farmyard should be tidy that you know, no point in working out there and tripping over a gate and falling flat in your face and breaking your arm. So, you know, there's tidiness and tidiness. Um, so that should be really tidy and not necessarily without nettles because that's, nettles could be up against the wall. I just mean the actual physicality of the farmyard should be tidy. But once you get out on the farm, you know, the odd thistle here, the odd patch of nettles there, uh, and if there is an old machine or something, as long as it's tucked into the hedge and not out, not in danger, I don't, I don't really have a problem with it. Uh, and, um, you know, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, you, you broke up there, Bren. No, go ahead. You're, you're in mid-flow. Um, I was going to talk about maybe with regard to hedgerows in particular. How do you manage your hedgerows um, and this whole issue of keeping them nice and neat and tidy? Um, well, I keep the roadside hedges cut. They're cut in sort of end of the autumn, midwinter, um, and the internal hedges. I sell them cut. I sell them. Cut. I've got big woolly hedges. I have big sort of shelter belts, and it's really struck me this year um, the grass growth that is round those hedges. And I can't really explain it. We're in the midst of a drought here. Tommy may be lucky in Roscommon, Leitrim border, um, but at the moment we've had 66 or 67 dry days out of the last 76. So we're pretty short of grass, but where the most grass is, is within those hedgerows and with those tree, tree lines. 
and I'm not really able to explain why, but I think it's possibly to do with the combination of fungi, bacteria, whatever is in the soil, the microbes. I think that soil is a little bit more alive and more moisture retentive and more carbon retentive than in the paddocks themselves. Now, last year, we had a bumpy year for grass. I'm organic without the inverted commas, and we had a bumpy year, but this year we're tight. Um, but the hedgerows, I think, um, are interesting in that if you don't cut them, you sometimes don't have to cut them. If you cut a hedgerow a lot, you sort of have to keep cutting it, especially if you've got things like elder, and it can grow to six, eight feet in a year, uh, and ash, something similar. But if you don't cut them, they're inclined to slow down, especially hawthorn and blackthorn. Um, it's a bit like it's a bit like grazing grass. If you graze grass, it'll grow. If you don't graze it, it sort of settles down and grows nice and slowly and eventually heads out. And that's exactly what a hawthorn does. A hawthorn bush is not a redwood. It'll never grow to 300 feet tall. The maximum it'll grow to is maybe 25, 30 feet, depending on conditions. And the same in width. And so, Kim, is there any, and other farmers would be kind of saying, well, there's issues then around eligibility. If you let your hedgerows grow out, there's a concern there that you could be penalised by the department for um, various issues. Have you any kind of reassurance to give on that? Uh, absolutely none. Absolutely no reassurance at all. But if you can prove that your <laughs> cows are grazing the bottom of the hedge or the, or the sheep are grazing the bottom of the hedge, well, if the top grows out, you have a hedge a bit like a mushroom. There's plenty of shelter there uh, for, and you'll still have grass. And I never have any, I make hay principally. And okay, Kildare is quite different to Leitrim or Ross Common, but I never have any problem making hay under the tree line of the hedges. If, the, if, the, if it's suitable to make hay, the hay will dry under the hedge as well. Fantastic. And it also gives a lot of shelter from the sun uh, in these hot days. You'd feel sorry for some cattle out in a, an open field in this hot weather. The other thing I wanted to ask you about was you, the, you, the significance of the wet grasslands on your farm. Um, I, I guess those, that's a habitat which has suffered particularly over the years from, from, from drainage and things like that. How do you manage your wet grasslands? And how, uh, is, is obviously there is a compromise to be made in terms of productivity, or do you feel that that, 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 that is the case on your farm? Uh, I don't sp spread any artificial fertilizer, so um, I don't find there's a, a problem with productivity because in a year like this, I actually have grass in those wet grasslands. Um, so it's there as a buffer if I need it. Um, I've done a week, few bits of experiments in the last couple of years with the wet grasslands. One area, I fenced off an area about a little over half an acre and Outside this, there's quite a lot of rushes. Inside this, the rushes are actually diminishing. And the only way I can, can explain that is the, the other grasses, the flowers, the vast diversity of plants and insects and, and um, basically life is in it, is actually drowning out the rushes. Uh, now what I do is it's fenced off for the summer, but it's grazed in the winter and spring by the cows. and that seems to be doing something to the rushes. The vigour of those rushes is not as intense in that little area. And outside it, the cows are grazing, obviously in the autumn, but the summer as well, and the rushes are there. Now, I'm determined not to cut the rushes, and the idea is to actually swing the grass grazing season over um, so I can get more diversity and still have grazing later in the year. Very interesting. Um, in a, in yes, come across again. Can one other question I had. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You go ahead. Uh, in another in another field, I did an interesting thing last year. I, again, it's wet grassland, and the previous year, to 2018, I'd actually cut part of it twice because of the um, dry year. I got a hay crop and then I got a silage crop, um, and I just felt the fertility in the soil was would have gone down so last year i did um i let the whole thing grow after may right all the way through the year never put a cow into it and then we strip grazed it last last winter and we had 14 or 15 cows on 10 acres and it lasted three months just by strip grazing it and now all that has come back 
and you could see see all the, the um, diversity of flowers in it now and it didn't do it at a tap of harm in fact it's actually taken out the stronger of the grasses and hedges and allowed um, sedges and allowed the lesser plants to come through Very interesting, Kim. And last question, and then I might hand, 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 hand over to Bridget, but a lot of interest for myself and from a few others. Um, I think we have Sean O'Farrell and Eddie McGrath, who I think you might know, um, asking about biochar. Um, would you mind telling people a little bit about what biochar is and how you've worked with biochar? Because a lot of people might not know about this, but it's really interesting, I think. Okay, and this was uh, another thing I, I heard about um, and it was through the ash disease in England they were pumping biochar around the roots of ash trees and finding those particular ash trees were then immune to this ash disease and there seemed to be a lot of mysticism about biochar and you know it had to be done on very expensive machines and so on so I, I, I always like to find out and demystify things so I looked up and I found an American website and I, I, I designed the kill well, I found the design of the kiln, it was on open source, and I got a local fabricator to make it for me. And so then I went round and any of the old bits of wood that were lying around the farm, bits of hedges falling off, old bits of wood, wherever, instead of letting them rot and becoming the carbon becoming carbon dioxide again, which is basically what it does, uh, I actually put it through the, through the kiln. So what you do is you capture, the wood has grown, by taking in uh, photosynthesizing, by taking in carbon dioxide, forming carbon as in the wood. And then when you burn it without the absence of oxygen, uh, you actually carbonize it and what you have is charcoal, for want of a better word. But the bio comes in by actually using that as a, as a um, remediation into your soil. So what I do is I, uh, when I make a, a batch, I crush it, and that's just crushed very simply on the concrete, just with the massy and, and a ring roller, and we crush it, and we put it into the slurry, into the slurry tank, where it mixes with the slurry, uh, cuts down on methane, cuts down on nitrous oxide, cuts down on all sorts of things, but also binds with the slurry, and picks up the nitrogen. So it actually buffers, it's a carbon source, buffers the nitrogen, goes out into the fields. And when I put the slurry out, slurry goes out quite early in the year, it goes out in the umbilical cord system. I actually have no response, not one bit of response, which shows the nitrogen's locked up. A uh, bit disappointing that I don't have a response, but come, um, say, late March, when the soil begins to warm up, I get a huge response. And then when I have a normal year, I get gra great grass growth, and I don't want, I don't want and I don't need fertilizer. Very interesting. Um, the biochar, I think, has a great future. I was on the farm today and it was a bit disappointing. I was just moved the cows and something struck me. I had the smell of the burning bogs in North Kildare were all over the farm. And I could see the start of ash disease on practically every ash tree on the farm. And I was thinking that in the future, not too distant future, the whole of Ireland is going to have thousands and thousands of dead ash trees. And all that, if they is burnt as firewood, all that is going to go up in smoke, all that carbon dioxide, all that carbon go back into the air again. If that could be biocharred and put back into the soil, we would be killing two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, Kim, you mentioned drought once or twice, you know, that it's been a very dry summer. Um, can you, uh, I was actually going to ask you, has there been much burning in your area? But you, you've just mentioned that actually it has been burning on the bogs in Kildare around you. Um, Not so much around us, but north of us, yes. Okay. And uh, uh, what other kind of effects in your area are you starting to see from the drought? But in your livestock, in obviously your growth, um, with your farming system this year, do you, how do you feel it's, it's changing it? At the moment, the farm is quite resilient. Um, grass growth has definitely slowed down, but it's still happening. I'm not too sure how, um, because there, we have had little or no rain for the last three months. Um, so I think um, 
you have to have resilience in a farm. And I think my stocking rate's possibly a little bit too high, but uh, I have the right breed for the sunshine. I have Olbrax. Fair enough. Yeah. And uh, you, yeah, your Olbrax, they're from France, is it? They're, they're, from, they're from southern, southern France, uh, and they're quite happy with the sunshine, and they don't mind the winter either. Um, so I think when you're farming, you have to choose your system. You choose your breed. It doesn't matter whether it's crops or, or cows. And I think you, then you stick with them. I think if you keep chopping and changing, then you're always going to chase your tail. Okay, fair enough. Um, Kim, I'm just going to ask one question from an attendee and then I might invite Tommy back. Um, what, what do you do with ragwort? Or can you talk about invasive species on your farm in general? Uh, but this question is from a Deborah. What, what do you do with ragwort on your farm? Um, try not to get in too much of a paddy with it, especially thistles as well. Thistles I, I now ignore, totally ignore. Uh, I just, today I was out and I took a photograph of um, a card, a queen on a marsh thistle. And I was thinking it's very strange to see a marsh thistle flowering at the beginning of June. But going back to the lady's question about ragwort, I, in the past, used to pull it religiously. And then my two sons, wouldn't help me pull it anymore. So I had to think of a different thing. I, ragwort is a problem on where I have light, light soil, say sandy banks, these would be like eskers. So they're very thin soil in that. The ragwort can be a problem there. Two methods, turn your back and go away, which is probably not the right one. But um, what I try and do is let some of it flower, so the bees and butterflies can enjoy it because if you go to them it's covered in bees it's covered in all sorts of butterflies and just before it's a beginning to seed then probably cut it and um, I don't let the stock in then so if it's raining the, the it actually naturally rots down and I definitely never make it into hay or silage um, and in other places it's a plant that's reasonably easy to get rid of if you go around in the winter time just with a small mattock or even a sharp knife and just, just cut them. Cut them below ground level, um, like you were digging asparagus uh, and you just leave the plants there again. This thing of letting them get to six foot high and then giving yourself a hernia, pulling them is hard work, having done it. So I don't use sprays. Um, and if I miss one or two, I don't worry about it. Okay, I'm just going to invite Tommy back now and then um, if anyone has any questions for, for both of the farmers, uh, they can just type them into the Q&A there. And, um, but while, I, um, while we're waiting for Tommy to come back there, Tommy, if you just turn on your mute button as well. Kim, I'll just ask you, um, this is a question from Vincent Darmo. In your opinion, can organic or regenerative farming be as profitable as farming? Well, I think having read and certainly some, through some of the American evidence, regenerative biological farming can be even more profitable, more productive than conventional farming. Because biological farming, when taken to its ultimate, the gloves are off. You can, you can actually outgrow uh, conventional farming, uh, but your soil has to be absolutely perfect. Your inputs, you still would, might have inputs, um, but they're not of the... Um, uh, the artificial kind. They could, they should be minerals or um, or other inputs, uh, biostimulants. Now, these these could be expensive as well, but they're I think they're on the positive side, uh, and they will actually improve your soil. Um, I, for one, use biostimulants in in the slurry, which goes out, including biochar. Uh, I use humates. I use molasses. Um, I use a thing called polysulfate, which is a, is a rock and it's got calcium, potassium, sulfur and a small bit of magnesium in it. And these are all inputs I use on the farm um, for, for the grassland. Tommy, would you like to answer that question? Uh, just in case you missed it, the question was, do you feel that uh, organic and regenerative farming can be as profitable as organic, as, sorry, as conventional farming? Yeah, it's a, the, the, the thing with the organic farming is that you're keeping your costs down. You're, you know, um, as we say, and, or, and the other thing is you, you have to make the best use of what you have on the farm. 
Um, so when I started off with the organic farm and what I had here for hogs and the cattle over the winter was a duty loves. But um, the advice or with the organic standards had to take out the cubicles and to deep bed it with straw. And I done that for the first year, but the straw was quite expensive to buy because we had to lorry it in as well as buying it. So after that, we started, um, we had a, a good bit of rushes on the farm at the time. So we started putting the rushes and saving them, as you can save hay, get them nice and dry, and use them for bedding. So that has, that has worked out well, and I saved that cost of buying the straw. Is that is that a common practice um, saving rushes as as bedding? It is, yeah. In mean, this part of the country, and actually last year it was um, quite a bit of rushes sold in Leeds. Okay, perfect. Uh, Brendan. Yeah, thanks, Yeah, I know not just rushes, but I know bracken was commonly used as bedding, um, especially in the south of the country. Um, so um, another few questions on biochar. Um, uh, um, I think there's a lot of interest in, in, in biochar. We've uh, we've a comment there from um, somebody about biochar. Is it rich in potassium or potash, um, Kim? Uh, it would certainly have minerals in it. Um, I'm not sure the exact composition, but it's um, it depends on the heat that is generated when you're actually making it. I mean, you can have low low heat biochar, high heat biochar, uh, and they will all have different components of minerals. Um, when wood goes to ash, that's when you have a lot of potash. But when you keep it in its carbon state, uh, there's probably less minerals in it, but they're more diverse. Um, the kiln I use is a, is a thing called an Oregon kiln. Uh, and if you can look up YouTube and you'll see how it, how it works, um, it, it's quite efficient. Uh, I have a thermometer, infrared thermometer, and it gets up to somewhere between, um, when it's running really hot, somewhere between 560 and 800 degrees centigrade. I have a question. Um, sorry, Rich. <laughs> somebody just said that in County Clare, we're eating potatoes at the moment that are grown in biochar rich soil, yum. So that's a good that's a good that testament to it. Um, can I another little question here? Is there an efficient organic way to get rid of bracken on neglected land? I know um, they say around here that bracken grows on kind of good land that's been neglected a little bit. Any advice from Tommy or Kim about controlling bracken? Do you want to go ahead, Tommy? Um, well, I, w I wouldn't have a problem with bracken on waiver, but uh, I've I've seen. Um, Something an article one time where people if it was rolled was um what what was the it's was a certain thing type of roll or what came kind of little wings and yeah you know, kind of crimps and uh, to crimp the stalk of the bracken that that was uh, deemed to be quite effective. Um, can't just think of the name of the roller now, but uh, what they were doing what what this roller was being used for was to to ruin. <coughs> Um, to roll bracken, but then they were planting in something as well at the same time, in throat, and using the, the roll bracken as a munch. Kim? The National Trust in England were using um, a crimper roller, which so Tommy was correct, uh, to damage, what it does, it basically damages um, the plant without actually cutting it. And uh, Gertrude Jekyll, when she wrote her gardening books all those years ago, she recommended one way of getting rid of nettles was to actually trash them with a stick. So it's like it's death by a thousand cuts. So you're not actually cutting the plant, which would stimulate it. You're damaging it. So it has to try and heal itself. And you keep doing it, it, it eventually dies. Now, it might need two or three years of rolling with a crimper roller, but you will get rid of it. But look up the National Trust uh, website and you see where it's being done in various parts. Beating it with a stick has the added advantage of relieving stress, I'm sure. <laughs> I know in Clare, traditionally, they used to do what's called bushing, dragging a hawthorn bush to bruise the bracken uh, as it's about to unfurl and maybe hit it again as it, as it comes back a second time. So there are very labor intensive ways of, of, of doing it. Um, quick question before I hand back to Bridges. Um, there seems to be an interest in farming. This is from Michael Devery. 
However, average farm size also seems to be increasing over time as small parcels of land are hard to come by. How would you suggest people get into farming without the overhead of a huge parcel of land? Kim, maybe any ideas on that front? Uh, yeah, um, very difficult. I mean, I think one of the big problems for, for a lot of Irish farms is this disjointed land where, you know, a lot of farmers are in a jeep and trailer most days of the week. I'm one of the lucky ones that I have a, a land in all in one parcel and I do um, sympathise with farmers who have to go all over the place um, with the land. But I mean, how you buy land, I don't know. Um, you know, it, it's always way too expensive in this country and it's always been that way and how you get around it, I haven't a clue other than win the lottery. Yeah, I mean, in fairness, it's a very difficult question. I would say that um, I know at Farm for Nature Bridge that there's an awful lot of people in contact who have small pieces of land who want a bit of support in managing it in a, in a more nature-friendly way. So there's certainly ways in which aspiring farmers and landowners can be connected. And that's something we'd love to see happen a little bit more in the future. Another quick question. When would you cut rushes for bedding, Kim? Well, that's for, for Tommy, because we, we don't do it here. <laughs> We have the advantage on you there, Kim, that we've got the foundations for growing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the best time to cut the rushes, and I suppose it's like anything, is, um, if you want to get rid of it, <coughs> yeah, allow the rushes to, to grow, right? And then you'll see the little flower coming out on it. But when the flower has come out, and the flowers are coming out on them now at the moment, you'll see up near the top of the rush, you'll see first and up to the side of it. So when, when the flower comes out, the next thing that will happen after that is that the flower or it'll go to seed. So between between the flower coming out and it going to seed, the plant at that stage, or the, the root ball of the plant has put all its energy into doing that. So if you cut them at, you know, at the end of June, that sort of thing, uh, it, you'll weaken the root ball in the ground. And that's what it's all about. Whereas if you cut them early on in the year, you know, there'll be a rapid growth to get a, a a spike back up again for, to produce the flower. That's what the, the root ball is trying to do. So yeah, around the vintage would be your best time. And uh, just while I'm talking to you, the name of the roller that I, I did see about for the criminal, it was called a Chevron roller. It was an American thing. Okay. Okay. Thanks right. very much. Um, I've one, sorry Bridget, you let me one more question before we finish. Um, <laughs> I finish and I'll pass back to you. It's, it, it's an important one, I guess, for both of you. Um, it's about agri-environmental schemes. So at the moment, I suppose, we're coming to the end of one cap cycle and beginning another, and there's an opportunity to redesign, hopefully, agri-environmental schemes. If you had a magic wand, um, both Kim and Tommy, um, leaving the money aside, what type of agri-environmental scheme would, would kind of suit you? How would you like to see these agri-environmental schemes working um, with regard to your hole in your farm? Let me answer, go ahead. Yeah, I suppose that the, um, whatever, considering all the crises that we're in at the moment, we have to start looking at the carbon story and uh, how, how we can go about storing the carbon in the ground that we have. And uh, we'd say, especially um, managing that carbon, we'd say on wet soils, <coughs> coming in on those wet soils and changing that land use to forestry, especially Sydney spruce. It looks as if we're doing a good job, but the danger is that we're actually losing more in terms of carbon than we're actually gaining. So whatever scheme comes in for us, it's going to have to be about the farmers managing the, the carbon on their farm and getting payments towards that. I, I, would, I would agree with Tommy completely. Um, and I think uh, certainly on our side, we don't have the sick spruce problem that Tommy has, but we have, um, just in my own case, with the ash disease uh, on the farm, you know, we've lost a lot of, we will lose a lot of ash, but because I planted a diverse forest, um, it's just a, an early thinning. I was walking the forest today and there's oak and there's chestnut and there's sequoias, there's Norway spruce, there's larch. I think we need to have more diverse trees. Um, I think we need to have forest for forest's sake, not necessarily as a, as a plantation, as a wood source. I think it needs to be there as a carbon store. 
um, and and for wood, but I think the carbon store is probably the most important. I think, as Tommy said, we need to be paid for our carbon um, and our meadows, uh, which I would have the old old meadows want to be recognised for what they are. They're also carbon stores, uh, and they will actually build humus, build build organic matter, and if it's if it's kept reasonably wet, then they don't lose their carbon either. And just on the on the part of wet meadows and diverse pastures, um, they're great at taking in methane because within those meadows and diverse uh, grazing, you have methane tropic uh, bacteria would actually eat methane. So they stop it. Once it comes out of the cows, they will actually, their prime source is to actually eat it. Fascinating. Thanks for that, Kim. Um, you've covered quite a lot there, in all fairness. Um, I, I actually asked Tommy this question earlier, but I, I didn't give you a chance to answer it. And you might, you might have answered it with your ash dieback, but what do you feel is the biggest threat on your farm to nature or your neighboring farms, Kim? Um, intensification and this drive, this um, what I nearly call false information about drive to feed the world. Um, I think Western agriculture is really only feeding Western people and I think we're doing a damn good job at starving the other side uh, like the Africa and, and South America and some of the poorer regions. Uh, Western agriculture is not very good for it. What we want is miraculously abundant small farms like something like 80 percent of the world's food is produced on five acres or less uh, and i think we need to be able to promote small farms circular economies circular um food and food that doesn't travel from one end of the world to the other i know we can't have guava for breakfast grown in leitrim but we can have plenty of apples and pears and and, and so on if we get the right varieties mm -hmm. That's interesting. I mean, how, just leaning on from that, Kim, how hopeful are you for the future of farming in general, and I suppose your farm in particular? Uh, you have to be optimistic because food is the most important, or agriculture is the most important industry in the world. Food. None of us survive without it. Um, so we could all survive without the computer, without the telephone. Uh, without the aeroplane, but we can't survive without food. So I think you have to be optimistic about agriculture, but I'm not optimistic about Western agriculture because it just wants to uh, get bigger and bigger and squeeze out the smaller farmer. I think we need to have more small farmers and the small farmer needs to be encouraged because he's the one that can really produce a really good quality product that can be sold locally and a little bit further afield. But I think if, if the big agriculture gets gets it, it you know price of food will go up mm -hmm. Tommy, would you like to answer that question for me yeah I, I think i think in the future and i would be hopeful for the future but i think what we have to get people is grow more of their own food but and get, get people access onto land so that we say it might end up in a situation that we say a farmer someone might get a payment towards uh, allowing maybe two or three acres of an allotment on his farm and have somebody then managing that allotment, but have both allotments within two to three miles of each other, so that whoever wants to grow their own food will have access onto land, onto an allotment, and be able to work as part of a group doing that. Because it's as much about building community, the Brazilian community going forward as anything else. And I, I do believe that no matter what crisis comes towards us, as Kim has said, if we have our own local food and we're we have our own strong local community we survive as in any place really nice i think that's a really nice finish off from jane's talk you know through to you you're both exemplars of what can be done for nature on farms and what that and hopefully inspire other farmers to do so and um, just finishing up i just want to thank both of you and um, brendan is there any final final question you would like to ask no questions <laughs> Just to, just to thank the speakers, um, I know Jane presented us with the challenges facing biodiversity in Ireland and there are many and we know how dependent we are on farming and food production in Ireland so it's trying to find the balance between food production and biodiversity. It's not easy but I think we've heard from two farmers who've been doing it for years and years and their knowledge and their ability to express that knowledge uh, in, in a very practical and meaningful way is absolutely inspirational. 
And I think that's why Farming for Nature uh, was set up. Um, it's a way for farmers to take ownership of the conservation agenda, for them to share their stories, their practical knowledge, and their inspiration with other farmers across Ireland so that we can together work for farming uh, and provide diversity. And I think it's not, it has to pay. It's a business proposition. There has to be good uh, technical support and there has to be respect for farmers to do that. And I think we've had two, as you said, Bridget, great exemplars of that tonight. So thank you both to Kim and Tommy, as usual. Keep up the good work. You, you guys are amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, follow more, um, like see more videos of farmers like uh, Tommy and Kim or listen to podcasts and stuff, go to farmingfornature.ie. 